Welcome to the Just Word Podcast. I'm Pat Bolland. The Just Word Podcast is brought to you by Just Wealth, investing the way it should be, just for you. Welcome back to the Just Word Podcast. You know, financial literacy is on everybody's lips, but what does it mean? Is it the ability to make smart decisions with money? And who does it apply to? Well, Ali Pyle is an investment advisor with CIBC Wood Gundy, and she's going to join me right after this word from our sponsor. Ali, great to see you again. And I guess what the audience doesn't know is you and I have a history in terms of your dad was on my TV show, and now you're on my podcast. I'm so thrilled. We do. Thank you so much for having me, Pat. I can't. How old, how old do you think you were when you were, uh, at, you attended, right? I did. And I believe I was wearing a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey. And if I had to guess, I think I was eight or nine. Oh, wow. Okay. So it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. I won't say how old I am now or how many years ago that was, but. And you, you and you follow. Yeah, exactly. Don't do that. They can do the math. We won't do that. (laughs) You follow in your dad's footsteps and you're doing an investment advice role, but you also did something recently called eat pizza, talk money. What was that about? So it actually started with this a little bit of a pet project, I guess, going out into local communities and talking about financial literacy. Um, I have always been fortunate that it's been a conversation continuously around me. I started working for the bank when I was 17 or 18. So it's been a a subject topic very familiar to me. Um, But I found it was missing in in local areas, whether it be youth, adults. So pre-pandemic, I had gone out to a local library, given a presentation. Um, The organizers invited me back after restrictions were lifted, uh, did a a very generic broad-based talk to all ages. And they said, well, I think we really need this for the younger cohort. So would you mind kind of gearing a conversation just around that? And I said, absolutely. Okay. So is it your experience that financial literacy is missing in youth? I think it's missing not so much in the content respect, but just the delivery. Um, I think you need to know where to go to look for it, what sources you can trust, what you need to watch out for, and really just starting that conversation. I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's an everyday dinner table conversation that's had. No, fair enough. But it it also seems somewhat of a dated uh uh, kind of an idea because with social media around and and the ability to access whatever you want on the internet, wouldn't that have all the answers for the youth? It does in the sense that, so I think if we kind of break it apart, so in terms of access and platform, social media has been a huge benefit, but with that comes some complexities as well, because, you know, it's, there's a lot of generic information out there. And I think what's really important to remember is that not all the information is coming from qualified professionals. So you really have to vet your sources and make sure where you are going for that information is coming from a trusted, you know, whether it's an institution or an individual. Okay, I I wanna come back to that, but I wanna start with something even more basic, if you don't mind. Because when I think about it, I I do my money transfers now electronically. And there are many people that are younger that have actually never held a physical dollar in their hands. So starting the conversation has gotta begin with holding money and understanding money. Is that element there? I think so. I think most youth and I'll stick to kind of that cohort understand understands how a dollar is earned but I think the value of that dollar can sometimes get lost especially coming through the pandemic I mean we've seen you know record inflation which kind of devalues that dollar and I think until there's a form of financial obligation I mean for a lot of youth a dollar is their dollar to to spend and burn right yeah. So it's 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 basically all discretionary income and they can do what they want, but they move through their life stages so quickly. And I mean, as young at, as 17, they're off to university and all of a sudden they're responsible for groceries and rent and cell phone bills. And that can, you know, that's a pretty quick turn for someone yeah, that's it, lived it at home. It comes home to roost pretty fast, doesn't it? When you, when you actually yeah. have to pay the bills. 
Absolutely. So I think starting that conversation of, okay, yes, here's the dollar that you earn, but how far do you have to stretch that dollar? And if you spend today, 100% of that dollar, I mean, that takes away from future consumption too. And also getting youth into a savings mentality, I think is really important and to have that conversation around sort of spending and saving strategies. Okay, so let's go back to the social media because uh, you uh, indicated that the best place to start might be in social media, but you have to vet your sources. How do you do that? How do you vet the sources? How do you know who to trust? So, I mean, the the most straightforward way, if you're using social media, I mean, I think especially here in Canada, our banks do a really great job at having tools and resources there. There's savings calculators, there's budgeting calculators. So I think going to those larger trusted sources is a great place to start. Um, There's websites through the government of Canada that talk about budgeting and what is financial literacy. So I think there's a lot of trusted sources that you can go to first. I think too, we forget we're in this digital world and we kind of live in this instant, you know, mentality, but we forget the value of just sitting down and having a conversation with an advisor or someone at your bank, you know, whether it be a teller or a personal banking advisor, there's always someone that's going to be willing to have that conversation. Okay. And as you and I both know, there is no one size fits all as far as uh, financial literacy and financial planning is concerned. What's the basic and where you get started? And then I want to walk through the stages of life. So as a youth, where where might you start? Yeah, so 100% right. There is no one size fits all. I think when we, you know, when we're turning to social media outlets or platforms, we do a, you know, we type in a quick Google search and we get a very, you know, bolded top line, two sentence answer. And it might be very accurate, but it's also very generic. So are you part of maybe the, you know, the 50 to 60% that it applies to, or are you the other percentage, right? So starting just understanding that is important. So going back to youth first, I think we start with the basics. So we start with even what does a paycheck look like? A lot of you know, it, it seems really intuitive to us because we've been working for years. But as a teenager starting, you know, in your first job, you understand that you make, you know, X number of dollars per hour. And then you get a, I won't say paycheck because I don't even think those exist anymore. I think it's all direct <laughs> deposit right. into your bank <laughs> account. But, you know, you get your deposit and there's a gap, right? The individual's going, well, I thought I was making $16 an hour and I worked X number of dollars and why doesn't this add up? So even understanding, you know, what are taxes? What do we pay into as a working individual? Are we accumulating RSP room? There's so many things that happen behind the scenes that, you know, we understand and take for granted, but someone starting out wouldn't necessarily know that. So that's, I think, one of the best. So when I gave the eat pizza, talk money, well, first I got their attention with the pizza, but then, you know, we <laughs> talked about what does a pay stub look like and and you're earning your money and where does it go? And then the conversation sort of has, has a natural uh, trajectory from there. Okay. Is the next step then, and I hate this word because I am not a follower, but a uh, budget. It, a lot of people don't like that word because I think that, <laughs> no, because I think there's a bit of a myth sometimes that budgets have to be restrictive, right? Because yeah. we think of it as this is what I have to, you know, these are the bills that I have and this is what I have left over. But a budget can actually be a really beneficial exercise if you think about paying yourself as part of your budget, right? So we've got this thing that we talk about, um, you know, the 50, 20, 30 rule. And when you get paid, you sort of, you know, 50% are going to everyday expenses, whether it be groceries, cell phone bills, what have you. Uh, 20% is paying yourself first. So that's your savings. And then 30% can go to discretionary items such as, you know, new clothes, new shoes, that sort of thing. So I think if you think of a budget from a holistic standpoint and include yourself in that, It becomes a much more, I think, enjoyable, I'll use the word, exercise as much as it can be. Yeah, but it does set the limits on things. So that's where I see the restrictions. That said, we had a guest on the podcast a a few months ago that was talking about uh, self-employment and pay yourself first as part of the program. So you're doing the same thing. 
even with a paycheck that comes from somebody else, make sure you designate a certain amount for that. Absolutely. And I think to your earlier point, Pat, we don't hold dollars anymore, right? We mm-hmm. live in, a, you know, almost 100% cashless society. So when we don't have something tangible, I think it's very easy for us to go out and tap here and tap there. And if you're not kind of tracking that or paying attention to that, you could get yourself in a situation where your debt is building up. And of course, as we know, that has some negative consequences as well. Right. Okay. So let's move to the next stage. You're not a youth anymore. Let's, for argument's sake, say you get through university and you actually figure out your bills for heating and rent and all those kinds of things. And you started into a family. Um, Obviously, your costs are going to go up significantly. Does the 50, 20, 30 change? I think it can change depending on, I mean, when we're in that life stage, a lot of us are looking at, you know, purchasing vehicles, purchasing a home, rent, whatever that, whatever that is for your situation. So it does become, I think, a little bit more difficult. And I think the, I think the percentages can change, but I think the notion that underlies them, you should try to stick to. So whether it be, you know, a very small payroll deduction that comes before you even see them your paycheck in your bank account goes to some form of a savings that can be those small steps early on, I think build a good foundation and start some good habits that you can carry with you. Um, But I do agree in that stage of life, the expenses are usually more than the income. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when you start to get into debt. So I want to talk about two things, debt uh, and mortgages. Do people have an understanding at any age, not just at a youth, but even as they get into their, Um, you know, married years and and so on. So debt, and then I'll follow that up with when when you get into investments. So let's do debt. So debt first, everyone loves to talk about debt. Get it out of the way, way, right? That uncomfortable conversation. So debt is not necessarily a bad thing because there's some major purchases that become assets for us. If we think about a house, right? I mean, that's an asset that will appreciate over time. And for most individuals, we don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in a bank account to go and buy that house with cash. So there are some things I think is good debt or appropriate debt. Um, I think if we maybe go one step deeper, I think a lot of Canadians need to understand what, you know, what their everyday habits, how that speaks to the debt that they can go to the bank and actually tap into, right? So we need to understand what goes into our credit score, what the bank looks at when they're, you know, adjudicating on a loan, whether it's for a car or a house, because there's a lot of factors that, you know, we just think we go in and they do a credit application and that's it, right? There's a lot of other things that go into it. Um, So going back to starting these good habits young, I mean, our, our history, our character, as we've had credit throughout our years, that all ties into when we get older and we're ready to make those major purchases, Um, I think understanding your debt is also really important. There's quite a few different products out there and making sure if you are going to carry a balance, you carry that on sort of the lowest interest burden product. So, you know, if you've got a credit card balance and you're paying 20%, if you can, you know, rotate that into a line of credit and pay maybe 10%, that's 10% in interest savings that would go a long way as well. You know, you start with the banks in terms of applying for mortgages, and and that's where the discussion was. But again, with the internet now, there are a lot of other places to borrow money. Fintech companies are all over the place, and you hear the advertisements on uh, radio. Um, Are are they generally reliable? Are they regulated, for instance, in Canada? In Canada, I think we do a very good job. I mean, there's, I think there's Nesto mortgages. There's some other sort of, you know, as you mentioned, fintech, there are, I mean, what's important is to kind of make sure the way that they're lending is appropriate. They're not going to have the, I mean, kind of getting into the nitty and gritty, but they don't have the same capital lending ratios as some of our big banks do. Mm. Um, But I think just understanding, we do a good job here in Canada, making sure that we're not overextending our individuals, right? Now, understanding the mortgage product you're in, I think as we've seen play out in the past two years with variable rate mortgages, that's super important to understand the type of product you're in. I mean, you get that, you know, piece of paper that you're pre-approved for a mortgage. 
that's first step. Step number two is, well, what kind of mortgage are you out there getting? And understanding all of the implications that go along with that. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into investments because my history in investments is interesting. I used to have a grass cutting business as a young, uh, I was a young boy at the time. And for every dollar that I earned, my dad would give me $9 and we'd invest the ten dollars, and but he did it in like hundred dollar increments. I, I forget how we did it exactly, but I started really young. I started at twelve, and obviously, I love the financial space as a result. What are your thoughts? When did you get started in investments? Number one, and what are your thoughts on when people should be looking at it? So, if we think about from a you know from the thirty thousand view sense, investing can be something as simple as just a a more of a sophisticated savings account, right? Sometimes when we hear the word investing, we're thinking about stocks and trading and all of that can be a little scary if you've never had experience with that before. But starting with, so to kind of get back to your question, I don't think there's too early of a time to start investing. I think you can start with a very simple, you know, you put 50 or $100 away a month. The nice thing is now as we've grown this industry and we've had, you know, huge advances in technology, there's a product out there that's suitable for everybody. So whether you're talking about a $500 portfolio or a $500,000 portfolio, I think knowing that there's a solution that best fits your need um, is out there and you just have to know the right places to go to. Well, you're, you, for instance, are uh, an investment advisor. You're not, I don't think, going to deal with the $500 people. You'd be happy to deal with the $500,000 people. Um, where does advice start to kick in? Where, where can you get advice if you're not at that $500,000 level? Yeah, so advice kicks in from the very beginning. So I started, I guess, my my experience coming into this role, I was a financial advisor with a bank branch and mutual fund license. And that's that's what we helped clients with. So I would have people as young as 18 come in wanting to start saving for their future. And we would go through actually very similar to what I would do now with my clients today. You go through an investment conversation geared towards risk tolerance ability to take that risk so that you're invested in something that is suitable for you as the individual, which again is where we kind of come back to there's no one size fits all. But to sort of answer your question, Pat, I mean, the bank talking to an advisor is a great place to start, even if it's $500. I think we've also got some great, um, I'll use the term robo advisors out there. I mean, there's Quest Trade, Wealth Simple. Those are all really great platforms to get started with. And our sponsor, Just Wealth, as well as, as part of that kit. But uh, when you know you bring up an interesting word or, or concept, risk tolerance, is there a way, I don't know, to measure risk tolerance? I mean, I know I'm a high risk kind of guy, <laughs> uh, but not everybody is. Yeah. So there's. I usually try to break it down into kind of two aspects. So there's quantitative and qualitative. When we think about quantitative, we're thinking about that individual's ability to take risk. And that comes from some financial measures. So we look up, we look at their income. We look at the stability of that income. We look at their time horizon. You know, are we, are we investing today to, to pull money out in six months? All those things that we can, you know, readily measure speak to one side of that. The ability is a much more, um, sometimes that can be an uncomfortable conversation to have. And it really, you've, you've got to walk the individual through digging a little bit deeper and, and tapping into how they actually view risk. You know, if the market goes down 10%, what is your reaction to that? Are you a pick up the phone and, and sell everything? Or are you on the other end of the spectrum? Are you pick up the phone and, and let's buy everything, right? Because that, and that's a little bit more difficult to measure, but we can kind of gauge responses and create some appropriate asset allocations from there. Yeah, so it, that aspect actually comes from experience, doesn't it? It does. And it's understanding, and you know, it's kind of interesting now as, you know, there, there's always new courses to go through and learnings to do. So behavioral finance is becoming a really big part of what we do day to day. Um, and it's all, it's all about knowing your client. It's knowing their habits. It's knowing their, their reactions. 
And that that's a really big piece of the financial picture when we're looking at someone that speaks, I think, volumes over the, you know, what does their portfolio look like in a statement? Hmm. Uh, we've gone through the youth part. We've gone through the midlife, I guess I would call it, and, and walking into debt and investments. End of life, or not even uh, end of life retirement, I guess I would get to next, uh, is an interesting one because the rules change considerably, in my opinion, when you get close to retirement and recognize I'm almost there. <laughs> they do. So I think actually one thing that we haven't touched on yet um, yeah. that probably, well, it's always important, but when you're looking at retirement, the biggest thing is going through some form of a financial planning process. Mm. Because I've had clients come to me and say, well, I heard you need $3 million to retire. And it's, you know, it's a quick Google search thing or, who, you know, they were talking to their golf buddy or whoever it was. And it's a really arbitrary value. And maybe for some people, $3 million is the magic number. But until you sit down and go through that planning exercise, you really don't know what your number is, right? You have to think about what are you doing in retirement? Are you working part time? Is it a, you know, is it a cold turkey stop and we're, we're off traveling? So all of these things tie into retirement and really what are we, what are our income sources at retirement? Have you saved into your own RSP? Do you have a company pension? You know, all of those sources are our inputs. And then we have to think about, you know, what are the outputs at the end? Yeah. And part of that financial plan would also, as you get older, again, uh, include estate planning, right? What Absolutely. You after you're gone. Absolutely. And sometimes that can be a, an uncomfortable conversation to have. No one likes to think about end of life, but I think what people do enjoy knowing is that if there's something that they feel passionate about, if there's a legacy that they want to create, that their wishes are, you know, are spelled out in a very clear and concise way so that they don't have to worry about that when it does come to that stage. Yeah. Yeah. End of life. Uh, you know, we started off with talking about uh, financial literacy and your point is well made that financial planning uh, needs to start at an earlier uh, level as well. Why isn't all this taught in school at a very young age? And I'm talking not just high school, for instance, even grade school, or is it? I think we're starting to see changes to the curriculum for the positive. I mean, we always, there's always been math taught, right? I mean, we're adding in kindergarten and as we go through our high school years, we're learning about, you know, compound interest and all that stuff. But I think there just needs to be a bridge from sort of that, you know, theoretical to the applicable, right? I mean, something as simple as what are taxes? And I think we're starting to see curriculums change. Um, there's a lot of great, I mean, I'll, I'll speak sort of to my local hometown in Peterborough. We have a group called the Junior Achievers that go out and bring programs to schools on financial literacy. So I think there's been some really great initiatives to sort of help bridge the gap, but we are starting to see curriculum start to change so that, you know, when we're, if, if I think back to when I was in grade five, if I could apply some of the math I was learning to a real life example, I think it would go, you know, it, it would speak volumes and really kind of sink in as opposed to just, you know, here I am in class learning something that I might be tested on, you know, a couple months down the road. Good point. So it all goes back to eat pizza, talk money, communicate, talk to people about what they're doing with their finances, right? Absolutely. Having starting the conversation is the easiest way to do it. Um, and there's a lot of people out there that are super passionate about making sure everyone has access to the same information and opportunity. So you just have to have to start asking the questions. And hopefully this goes a long way, Allie, towards helping that. Allie, great to see you again and say hi to your dad and family. And thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Pat. It's been great. Allie Pyle, CIBC Woodgundy.